Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the September 2017 Soils Network of Knowledge webinar and also thank you for your patience and understanding with the reschedule of this month's webinar. So now I would like to introduce Mark Peoples who is Research Director of the Crop Improvement for Novel Plant Products Program at the CSIRO's Agricultural Flagship. Mark's scientific career has focused on aspects of plant nitrogen nutrition and he's been instrumental in the development and ev evaluation of methodologies to quantify biological end fixation by legumes in cropping, forage and agroforestry systems. Mark's also studied the role of legume and brassica break crops in the management of soil nitrogen, water, weeds and disease in cereal dominated cropping systems. The aim of his work at with the CSIRO has, where he's worked since 1985, has been to improve sustainability and profitability of both Australian and Asian, Asian cropping and forage systems. So Snock welcomes Mark today to answer the question, are there useful rules of thumb to assist farmers nitrogen decision making when wheat is grown after a legume? All right. Terrific. So this uh, first slide I'm going to show is um, experimental data from a whole range of experiments undertaken at various locations um, uh, up the east coast of, of Australia. And what I've shown here is um, the levels of soil mineral nitrogen that gets uh, that was measured um, following um, various crops. Now all the legume crops are indicated in red and non legumes uh, in, in black or open sim symbols um, and this is this is the measure of the, the amount of soil mineral nitrogen that's measured um, just prior to showing sowing wheat and um, I'm also indicating there the uh, the wheat yield that was was measured after those various crops so, so it's quite clear from this sort of information that the nitrogen contributed by legumes uh, represents an important component of nitrogen supplied to subsistence cereal crops. However, most Australian grain growers uh, don't routinely monitor soil mineral nitrogen after applying, uh, before applying fertiliser uh, nitrogen to, to crops grown after legumes. So today I'm going to talk about uh, two things essentially. Um, the legume effects on, on so soil available nitrogen and the nitrogen uptake by um, sub subsequent wheat crops. Um, my, my presentation um, will essentially be reporting uh, various insights we've got into uh, the impact of, of legumes on, um, on the nitrogen dynamics of farming systems, um, but in cereal dominated cropping sequences. That's been obtained from 16 different uh, rain fed experiments conducted uh, across Eastern Australia between 1989 to um, 2016. So the, the data that we've uh, collected um, from these studies um, have been examined to, uh, to try and explore the possibility of developing simple predictive relationships which farmers or their advisors could use uh, to benchmark the expected uh, amounts of uh, additional mineral nitrogen that you might get after legumes and the relative value of legume nitrogen to a following wheat crop. Now you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to talk about every one of those uh, 16 experiments in detail but what I will do is just uh, select uh, one, one uh, legume treatment from one experiment uh, to walk walk you through how we've done these sorts of calculations. And this uh, particular experiment was um, started in 2011 uh, at Juni Reefs near, near Juni um, in southern New South Wales. And in 2011, we grew lupin, uh, wheat and canola. Then um, in the following year, we grew, we measured soil mineral nitrogen prior to sowing under all those treatments, and uh, we sowed wheat. Uh, 
So the, the sorts of data um, that uh, we generated from this experiment is shown here. So I've indicated the, what legume crop was grown in 2011. Um, and I've also indicated uh, the grain yield by the, that lupin, wheat and canola crops to give you some idea of the, uh, the productivity. At the end of um, 2011, we, we did more than just measure grain yield. We actually measured uh, the amount of shoot residue that was, uh, that remained after, after harvest. And we measured the amount of uh, nitrogen that was present in the above ground residue and um, included an estimate of how much nitrogen might also be in the, the roots of those uh, various crops. So where you see a value of, of residue nitrogen there, that indicates it's an estimate of um, above and below ground um, nitrogen. So at the bottom, I've also indicated um, um, a bit more detail about how much nitrogen was in that lupin crop. Um, essentially, there was 188 kilos of nitrogen in the above and below ground residues and um, essentially uh, 210 kilos of nitrogen were removed in the grain. So in my next slide um, um, gives, presents the data that we measured in the following autumn prior to sowing um, the next wheat crop. It measures the soil mineral nitrogen to 1.2 metres, which is uh, in in uh, most most uh, crops in southern New South Wales is the sort of expected uh, maximum rooting depth of of wheat, and um, in that far right hand column, I've indicated the amount of a mineral. Uh, mineral nitrogen that was measured in the autumn of 2012. So there was 110 kilos of mineral land after the lupin and 70 kilos um, after the wheat, 72 after the canola. So essentially by growing that legume crop, um, there was an additional 40 kilos of, of uh, mineral land um, present in the soil. Now there's a number of uh, environmental uh, and biophysical factors that can impact uh, on soil mineral nitrogen after legumes. Uh, one of them is rainfall that occurs over the fallow period between uh, the end of, of uh, one growing season and the beginning of the next. So essentially the rainfall over summer and early autumn um, because this uh, stimulates microbial activity that's needed to break down the legume residues, but uh, it also uh, stimulates uh, weed growth and um, germination growth and can also uh, influence the risk of nitrogen losses. So the rainfall over the fallow period is quite, quite important for a number of reasons. The amount of shoot residue biomass that, that re was remaining at the end of the growing season um, is also important. Uh, because that essentially limits the potential inputs of above ground legume nitrogen. And finally, the nitrogen content or the quality, uh, particularly the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the legume residues is very important because this determines the amount of legume nitrogen contribute to the system and also uh, determines whether you get mineralization or uh, immobilization of, of the nitrogen. So on uh, this, this slide here, um, I've actually looked at that additional mineral nitrogen and I've considered um, the impact of fallow rainfall, the impact of residue dry matter and the, the impact of nitrogen. And we come up with uh, um, uh, that 40 kilos of additional mineral nitrogen represented 0.1 kilos of mineral end per millimetre of fallow rain, 10 kilos of uh, nitrogen per tonne of uh, above ground dry matter, and it represented about 21% of the, what we estimated to be the amount of residue nitrogen uh, that was left behind after the, after the looping crop. So 
um, if we go back to all those, all those 16 experiments, we had 19 different uh, non-legume crops, uh, mostly wheat, barley, um, and, and or canola. And you can see the range of values that we measured um, following all those crops uh, was uh, went from 36 to 141 kilos mineral nitrogen essentially reflecting the, the background level of, of soil fertility at those different sites and in those different seasons. And the overall, the average was about 73 um, kilos of mineral in after a non-legume. Now after the legume crops, um, after those 28 legume crops, we also got quite a wide range, anything from 55 to 210 uh, kilos of, of mineral in with an average value of around about 110. And the soil mineral N measure was uh, significantly greater uh, in 26 of so those 20 leg 28 legume treatments than the non-legume. So essentially, um, if we look at the increase in soil mineral nitrogen, of those 26 crops where there was a significant difference between mineral nitrogen. The range was from 11 to 89 or, or uh, on average uh, 35 additional kilos of mineral in um, after a legume crop. Now uh, on this next slide, what I've provided is a bit more detail. Um, I've indicated the additional average additional mineral N after various crops, um, after various legume crops, and you can look at that in detail for your most favourite legume um, to see what impact it had. But essentially, I've done undertaken similar calculations for every one of those treatments in every one of those experiments in every one of those uh, those uh, years, and uh, calculated. Um, the additional mineral nitrogen on the basis of millimetre rainfall, residue dry matter and a residue nitrogen. So on average across all 26 crops, um, we had on average 0.15 kilos of mineral N per adi additional mineral N per millimetre rain fallow rainfall, nine kilos per tonne of shoot dry matter and it represented about 28% of the residue, which we estimated residue nitrogen. Now you can scan across all those, all the different legume species that uh, crops that we used. Um, and uh, I, I must admit, I'm a little surprised, but there, there's not a huge amount of, uh, of variation. Um, and that I found that uh, promising that Perhaps um, there may be some useful relation. These may be useful relationships that we could uh, we could utilise. So, uh, in terms of uh, providing um, a measure of all those things, most uh, farmers would would know how much uh, rainfall they had over the fallow period they'd measure grain yield, but they may not know, for example, how much shoot residue there, there is. Now across all these um, experiments that we undertook, um, we found that the harvest index, that is the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, dry matter in the grain uh, versus the rest of the crop, uh, represented about a third of the total above ground dry matter. So uh, a rule of thumb that farmers could use if they wanted to calculate how much shoot residues uh, might be left behind from a legume crop, it essentially would be equivalent to about twice grain yield. Um, because uh, grain yield is, is something that all far farmers would, uh, would know, uh, we thought it would be also useful to uh, see if there are any, is a, a usable or a useful relationship between um, the additional mineral nitrogen that we measured and grain yield. Um, and so that, that last column on the far, far right hand side also provides, a, a, I guess, a fourth way of, of uh, uh, guesstimating or, or uh, benchmarking 
um, additional mineral nitrogen on the basis of grain yield. And there the average value was uh, around about 18 kilos of, of additional mineral N um, for every tonne of uh, grain yield harvested. So here's those uh, average values again. Um, and I've also indicated the sorts of, of uh, variation, um, standard uh, variation um, in terms of the estimates across all these 16 experiments. So the question is, uh, which ones of these uh, uh, might be usable? Um, what what we we did was we didn't have a um, independent data set to to validate these uh, these relationships. But what we could do was use the, those average values and reapply them to the original the original data that, that we generated from all those experiments, and then see how how. Uh, Good. The prediction on the basis of of uh, the using these average relationships were uh, to the real data, to the real results, and we found that uh, if you used fellow rainfall, it explained about 24% of the variation. If we looked at uh, shoot residue dry matter, that explained about 35% of the variation we saw in the data. Uh, the residue nitrogen, the nitrogen measurements explained about 57% of the variation. And finally, if we used uh, grain yield, uh, it, it explained 27% of the variation. And um, the, the question is, which ones of these might be useful for, for farmers and advisors? You know, with with average farm sizes of uh, in Australia uh, um, of of over two and a half thousand uh, hectares, we recognise that very few Australian grain growers routinely conduct pre-season soil tests prior to cropping. So, which which of these might be useful? Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, they they're bound to know what uh, fellow what rainfall occurred over summer and autumn. Um, they certainly would know how much grain they harvested. Um, they could calculate uh, shoot residues um, by uh, multiplying grain yield by two. Perhaps our most useful relationship um, based on, on residue nitrogen is just simply something that most farmers would be unable to uh, estimate or measure. So we thought um, if uh, we we could, uh, if there's such a close relationship be between grain yield and uh, and shoot uh, dry dry matter in terms of harvest index, perhaps there's also a, a relationship between grain yield and total residue nitrogen. So we plotted out all the data from. Um, those 16 experiments, and we used uh, data from other additional experiments that that uh, um, both published and unpublished uh, information, and we generated uh, um, a fairly uh, reasonable sorts of sort of relationship that we thought perhaps we could use this um, to help um, with the calculations. So. Um, in terms of residue nitrogen, perhaps if there's 28% of the legume and uh, above and below ground residue nitrogen uh, as, as a rough rule of thumb, you can have a, a slightly more complicated relationship um, shown here of, of uh, multiplying uh, that 54 plus 30 times uh, grain yield by um, 28 uh, percent to to estimate um, uh, uh, the the additional mineral end that that you might expect. I'm now going to move on and talk about uh, the apparent recovery of legume nitrogen by following wheat crop. And these are uh, uh, this is a, a photos of wheat after wheat 
and wheat after legume from that Juni reefs experiment. Um, when we looked at uh, the uh, mineral nitrogen and then the wheat nitrogen up, uptake uh, across all those 16 experiments, we found that wheat nitrogen uptake was only less than the soil mineral nitrogen that was measured at sowing in only two uh, two of eight experiments. I, I should actually say um, uh, at this point, um, although we measured grain yield and, and grain quality in all 16 experiments, we only had reliable measures of uh, stubble nitrogen uh, for eight of those 16 experiments. So we were really only able to calculate um, wheat total nitrogen uptake uh, from from those eight experiments. And of those eight experiments, um, wheat nitrogen uptake was greater than the soil mineral nitrogen measured at sowing in six of the experiments. Okay, so data from six of the experiments fell above that one is to one line. What that indicates is that in those six, in basically uh, six of the eight experiments, in crop mineralization of nitrogen was an, a really important um, component of the nitrogen nutrition. And, and on average, uh, there was 1.34 kilos of wheat nitrogen for every kilo of pre-season soil mineral nitrogen we measured. So uh, what you measure at the beginning of the, of the growing season isn't uh, isn't necessarily all the nitrogen that you, that your uh, uh, wheat crops going to see or use is is basically the take home message in most in most in most situations. Now, if we look at this next slide, we go back to that uh, Juni Reefs experiment um, again, just as an example, and uh, we we found uh, that the wheat crop that was grown after the lupin. Um, accumulated 56 kilos uh, of uh, more nitrogen um, than the, the wheat crop grown after wheat. So if we look at the apparent recovery of that lupin nitrogen um, by essentially dividing that difference at 56 kilos by the amount of uh, residue nitrogen that we we reckoned was uh, left behind at uh, after the loop at the end of the previous growing season, at 188 kilos, we calculated that 30% of um, um, of that uh, uh, apparent recovery of 30% of the residue nitrogen uh, was taken up by that weed crop. Um, again, if we look across all the experiments where we we had the available data. Um, the values where we undertook similar calculations, so the recovery ranged from about 21 to 48% apparent recovery of the legume nitrogen, but on average, um, the 30% of, of the uh, residue nitrogen was recovered. Now, just remember, I'm talking about, and I'm talking about recovery of nitrogen or nitrogen uptake, that's in, both in the shoot and the root. Um, often the, the sorts of values that you might read about uh, in um, in reports it focuses only on the above ground nitrogen. So uh, a value of 30% total plants equivalent to uh, about a 20% um, recovery of leggy nitrogen just in the above ground uh, um, stubble and, and grain. So I've already talked about uh, four potential rules of thumb to estimate additional mineral nitrogen. It could be a, a fifth uh, rule of thumb here that 30% of the residue nitrogen um, is might be what you might expect to be recovered by uh, the next wheat crop. And using that relationship that I, uh, I talked about earlier, um, it's a little bit complicated, but at least provides some means just 
to do a simple back of the envelope calculation of how much mineral nitrogen you might expect to recover from a, a, a legume crop, your own legume crop in your own uh, environment. Now, often I'm asked, how does this compare to fertiliser nitrogen? Well, in fact, in um, three of uh, the uh, experiments we we had, we were able to um, actually compare side by side recovery of uh, legume nitrogen with recovery of fertiliser nitrogen, where we had fertiliser treatments applied, different fertiliser treatments applied to the uh, uh, wheat after wheat type treatments. And uh, in all those those uh, those three examples, though the nitrogen was applied um, just prior to stem elongation, so it was top dressed rather than applied at sowing. Um, and uh, on average, across those three experiments, and really there are only three experiments, we calculated that um, the wheat crop recovered about 64% of the fertilizer N. Again, uh, back calculating that on the basis of just the above ground nitrogen, that represented 42% recovery of, uh, of the fertilizer nitrogen. Now I've got, uh, I've shown two other examples there. Um, there was a, a, a paper written back in 2000, and a review back in 2004 that looked at the apparent recovery of fertilizer nitrogen uh, from 42 different um, experiments and the average there was 38 uh, percent. John Angus uh, recently published a, a, a re another review in 2017 with Peter Grace. Uh, they looked at 74 uh, grain crops, um, rain-fed grain crops, so it was mostly wheat but also canola um, and uh, barley I think um, and they got an average value of about 44 percent uh, recovery of fertilizer in. So even though it was only, the information only came from 40 from three experiments, um, our sort of um, average sort of recovery of top dressed fertilizer is sort of in the same ballpark that others have measured. So uh, the recovery of uh, fertilizer nitrogen is is higher. Um, than estimates a recovery of legume nitrogen, but you'd probably expect this because the fertiliser was applied in, in um, our experience just prior to the peak period of crop demand for nitrogen, and uh, that's the best way of guaranteeing uh, the most uh, efficient use of that fertiliser in. And of course, there's only a, a, a fraction of the legume nitrogen becomes available in the short term um, to be a, a, um, available for uh, Crop, crop uptake. So the advantage of the legume um, uh, is of course that it supports the longer term uh, fertility and in, in um, the experiments we've, we and others have done, you can generally expect um, at least some measurable uh, um, nitrogen benefit at least for the first two crops that you grow after, after a crop legume. If you're growing uh, cereal crops after um, um, a pasture phase of a legume based pasture, you could ex probably expect um, uh, at least three to four years of, of nitrogen benefit, particularly if it was grown after loosen. But anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's my presentation and I'd uh, welcome any, any questions. If I haven't confused you all uh, immensely. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you particularly because I know that you're actually also attending a conference at the moment, so thank you for taking the time out to present uh, this morning. So now we have opportunities for questions or comments of Mark, and we've got one question already from uh, Lisa Lobry de Bruin. And Lisa's just interested in the um, uh, your questions about whether um, farmers may measure pre-crop nitrogen. So she said, what's your evidence for that? Um, is it gut feel or have you asked farmers about whether they measure that? Uh, actually, um, I've had a 30 year career working for CSIRO and all my uh, 
work has been done on farm and farmers' fields. You can't grow too many uh, useful crops in Canberra that, that are meaningful. So I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, working with farmers. And in fact, the last five years, I've been involved in working with grower groups, uh, six grower groups from Condobolin around to Narracourt. And um, many of the better farmers uh, do measure uh, uh, salmonella nitrogen before making decisions about fertiliser, but uh, the majority don't. And the majority don't monitor every field every Every year. Um, so that was basically the the driver for for looking at other ways of, of providing um, estimates that uh, as I say rules of thumb that might be used to, um, a handy uh, uh, benchmark. So um, I, I guess I don't have quantitative evidence I couldn't say X percentage of farmers um, don't measure soil mineral nitrogen routinely before sowing crops, um, but um, I guess it's a combination of of um, doing a lot of work with farmers and um, and observations. Okay, thank you for that. I think um, that Luke may have a question. Thanks, Abby. Uh, yeah, Mark. Um, first, one's just rather than just focus on the additional mineral nitrogen from legumes. Would it have been better to focus on the total soil nitrogen? Yeah, that to be honest, that would be a much uh, um, a much more useful uh, measure. But um, across those sixteen experiments, the the measures of mineral N that we we determined after uh, the non legume crops, which is basically the the background mineralization that you're going to get naturally from the uh, soil organic matter range from 36 to 141 kilos of mineral N. So it was a huge range and it, it reflected the underlying uh, organic fertility of the, the soils. So basically the organic carbon and the organic nitrogen measures um, and uh, is, there are probably some soil type uh, differences there. but they're also going to be influenced by all these same things, you know, the the rainfall, fallow rainfall over uh, over the summer uh, fallow period, um, the amount of weed growth, um, all those those sorts of things too. Um, so, uh, you know, on average there was 73 kilos of additional mineral in after after a non-legume crop, but uh, you know, I'm not sure whether uh, I, it was probably too big an ask. To, I, I figured to try and calculate total mineral nitrogen because you have all these overlaying, um, uh, underlying differences in in soil fertility in different paddocks. So that's why I focused on looking at the additional mineral N uh, coming from from the legume. I thought we might have more of a chance to 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 determine that incremental improvement in mineral N. And basically all I'm, all I'm giving um, farmers uh, is a way of, of gauging that, well, if, you know, they, they were, they usually say put on 100 kilos of mineral, uh, 100 kilos of uh, fertilizer N, uh, that they, they might be able to make savings, you know, equivalent to, uh, um, you know, whatever they, they calculate uh, um, that the, the legume might be contributing. So it, it's more looking at uh, uh, a potential savings in, in fertiliser in over and above what they'd normally, normally apply. Okay. And uh, I was just going to ask also, could you just use the average of the extra nitrogen across all of the treatments? Yeah, you could. I mean, um, that, that value was 35 um, additional uh, 35 additional kilos of mineral in um, after, on average, across uh, after 26 different legume treatments. So again, that's that. That in itself is is probably uh, a reasonable uh, guide. That on average you might be able to save 35 kilos. But I thought that we might be able to uh, to refine it a little bit more than just uh, working on the average by taking in account those other things that. Um, such as fallow rainfall, such as the uh, 
essentially the productivity of the of the um, the legume crop, the amount of residues they leave behind, because all those sorts of things are going to be different in different in environments, different places, different farms. Thank you. There's a question here from Howard Cox. It says, how do you respond to a question about the legume nitrogen available in year two and beyond? Thanks for your question, Howard. Yeah, actually, um, the the sorts of values that that um, uh, we've measured in the year two, if, if about 30% of uh, the legume residue nitrogen is used by the first crop, we, we roughly measure about half that in the, uh, in the second crop. So about 10 to 15% of the residue nitrogen um, is uh, taken up by the second crop. And uh, it, it's likely probably about half of that again in, in year three, but by, the, by that stage, the numbers are starting to be a bit hard to get significant measure statistical significance. But anyway, that gives you some idea of of uh, um, how how that nitrogen um, is meted out. the 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 bulk of the the legume nitrogen is is boosting the overall or maintaining the overall um, nitrogen fertility of the soil and the and doing lots of other things actually in terms of soil structure and and stuff like that too. But but if if thirty percent on average is taken up by the first crop, you could probably uh, be safe in assuming that are around half that um, around 15% might be available for the second crop. Okay, thank you, Mark. Lisa's um, said thank you for you, the answer to her question and she's also asked, would it um, push them to um, use more legumes for their end requirements. Well, uh, legumes have a, a, a lot of a lot of other benefits from um, just simply uh, providing nitrogen. I mean, they they're quite in um, the work I was saying that I, I would, I've undertaken over the last uh, five years with with grow groups. We're actually looking at a whole range of issues. Um, it. Certainly, there are a lot of lot cheaper and more effective options to um, dealing with uh, herbicide resistant weeds, uh, rye grass in particular, um, compared to trying to struggle and getting on top of rye grass um, uh, in crop in in a in a wheat crop. Um, and so, legumes and canola are, are useful. Um, there's useful options there to drive down the uh, uh, seed, the weed seed bank um, mm. to try and get on top of, of weeds. Um, and just mm. for you, uh, another another rule of thumb, we found that for every tonne of uh, grass weed um, in uh, rye grass in a, in a, a wheat crop, um, the, the grain yield was reduced by half a tonne. And one tonne of Dry matter per hectare is actually not a huge amount, so um, it can help you get on top of weeds. Um, there, as I mentioned, there's been measured uh, soil structural benefits, and of course, you, it's a break for various disease, cereal root diseases in particular, um, and and diseases. So uh, we found across those um, five those five years where we looked at um, the rotational benefits of using break crops in in every experiment every year and across all those six grower uh, groups all the experiments we did um, with them the most profitable rotation included a break crop um, either a, a canola and or a legume um, so uh, you end up financially um, uh, across a rotation um, getting more per more uh, um, profit um, if you include break crops and some of that's due to uh, yield improvements as a result of the legumes um, some of it's due to savings of, of costs weed control um, um, and I guess I must, must admit the, 
in terms, I should qualify that on the basis of the, the grain prices that were that were uh, um, prevalent over since 2010, but um, 2011. But uh, yeah, that was the experience. Yeah, I'd say uh, grow more break crops, but I'm not biased. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. This uh, presentation is based on a paper that's really that's recently been published just in the last few weeks. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That would that would no, that would be fantastic. So um, yeah, if anyone is interested in that paper, just uh, let me know. Abigail Jenkins at dpi.nsw.gov.au, and I will um, forward that paper on to you. Um, uh, the, it was, it's not really a question, but Glenn Ubergang has a comment mm. about uh, effect on grain quality, i.e. wheat protein might be interesting, or does growing cereal crops following legumes alter any management strategy involving in-crop N applications? And then he said, I do understand it's a very complex system. Yeah, well, um, in every, uh, in, in, uh, Almost every instance, uh, grain protein was certainly improved, and that was our experience from the a lot of the additional um, uh, profit I was talking about was a result of both either a combination of increased yield, wheat yield, um, uh, but uh, also increased grain um, grain protein. So yes, yeah, certainly um, grain proteins vastly improved, and um, in terms of um, in-crop decisions, certainly if you were top dressing, uh, you know, wheat, uh, wheat on wheat, or even wheat after canola type uh, um, sequences, you'd have to top dress. You know, so there's signs of nitrogen deficiency uh, appears earlier than um, after a legume because you're getting that release of of additional release of mineral nitrogen. And in most seasons, uh, during the growth of the crop after a legume, that you're not going to necessarily see as much um, after, uh, wheat after wheat. I hope that answers those questions. We might call that a day then for that. And I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Mark very much for his presentation and um, his interesting work and sharing it with us and also thank all of you for attending uh, this month's SNOC webinar and supporting that and I look forward to seeing you all uh, next time so thank you Mark. Okay my, my pleasure I'm sorry it was a bit complicated but if it was easy it would have been done already I guess. Thank you very much. Okay no problem. <laughs>